Well, hello again and welcome everybody to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. I think this is number 72. Um, I, I'm on a roll here. Um, and we are going to go to Wednesdays and Thursdays, so we'll double up soon um, after Red Hat Summit, which is happening in a couple of weeks. And I'm really pleased today to have the folks from Treasure Data on the call. Eduardo Silva is going to give us a presentation on FluentD. It's a bit of an overview of FluentD and logging with um, FluentD. Um, I thought that would be set a good baseline for everybody because it's um, one of the, the projects under the Cloud Native Foundation's umbrella now, and um, we are trying to uh, make sure that uh, we give equal time to everything from Kubernetes to Prometheus to FluentD, and we'll go through most of the projects that are under the CNCF umbrella, hopefully, and future briefings as well. So without further ado, I'm going to let Eduardo introduce himself and talk about FluentD. You can ask questions in the chat. Um, we're going to try and let him get through his presentation. Um, so if you have like a burning question that's, you know, you're really confused, make sure you let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to save your questions for after his presentation and then there'll be an open Q&A. So Eduardo, take it away and thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Diane, for the invitation to participate from this uh, session. My name is Eduardo Silva. I'm from the Fluentd team at Treasure Data. And we're very close with the core developers of FluentD, so we always try to, to see how we can improve logging across different areas. A few years ago, it was mostly on, on standalone services. Then we started integrated how to fix logging with uh, containers. And then we joined it in the cloud native space with, uh, well, with orchestrators like Kubernetes and other systems. So when we talk about FluentD, we need to understand uh, the concept of logging. In the experience, we can see that most of people uh, do not understand very well about what logging is and why it's important. So that's why I want to introduce a little bit about it. The first thing is that when we have applications, our main goal is always to analyze how these applications are behaving. But in order to accomplish that, we need to some mechanism that allow us to collect some information from this application. Otherwise, analysis will be quite difficult. So the normal way to perform some analysis is that from the beginning of the application, we try to generate some log files or some any kind of log information, either in the file system or to the network. And then we try to centralize that information in some kind of common storage, so then we can do analysis. But in order to get to that point, it's quite hard. So how we can Make an application to write logs is quite easy, but centralize the logs is a bit complex. So how we accomplish that? We have a concept which is called the logging pipeline, in which we said that if you want to take one point from logs to a storage, you need to go to different phases. Like for example, collecting the data, parsing the data, filter the data, buffer the data, and sending the data out to a destination. So when we mention about a D or logging logging pipeline, we're referring to this scope from the input to the output, and we have many phases in the middle. And this is not so easy to handle because there are many problems. For example, if you think about the different inputs that we can have, you can say that maybe the syslog messages are quite different from Apache Web Server uh, log messages. So the input side needs to be quite uh, flexible in order to understand this. And you have to implement your own parsers, your own filters, and your own buffering mechanism to have a reliability uh, delivery mechanism for this, this to this, to send the logs to the right destination. So uh, at, at the beginning, uh, a few years ago, this was a quite complex because if you have many kind of inputs, you used to create your own scripts to parse the data, filter the data, and try to put that information back in some uh, database or cloud service. But the problem is that for any kind of new input source that you have, you try to create a new script or a new program or update your cron jobs, and it's complex. That is a solution that does not scale in current architectures. So uh, when we talk about logging and then we start talking about microservices, the things become more complex because as you know, everything now it's mostly running in containers. Applications run in containers. So each container has its own log, has the application logs. And if we take this to the cluster level, it's more complex. So the, we cannot have a small scripts guided in data if we have 
more than billion of continuous energy per week. So the thing is how we can solve this problem. So, and we can say now that after a few years of work with different companies, with different uh, users of adopters with con of containers and cloud solutions, we can say that FluentD is a reliable solution that fixed the whole login problem. FluentD was created initially by Treasure Data, and we are uh, the primary sponsor for the project, but there are also other companies contributing to it. And we donated the project to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation on last year in November. So right now, Treasure Data is a primary sponsor, but the project right now is hosted with the CNCF. So uh, we were mentioned about the login pipeline. So we were trying to see how to fix this, and we can say that the whole login solution now is through FluentD. So FluentD allows you to take the whole logs from different inputs and centralize that information back on any kind of storage solution. So, and things become easier. And despite that, FluentD is a really good solution for the problem. Also, we need to understand how things work internally. Otherwise, you cannot scale very well the solution. If you want to fix a problem, you need to understand what are the real pains. So about FluentD, we can say that uh, FluentD is quite big right now. Uh, despite uh, our company and maybe other companies, we maintain around 20 plugins. We can say that we have more than 600 plugins available, most more than 500 made by the community. So that is a, it's a really huge win for the whole system that needs a reliable solution. FluentD also has a pluggable architecture that means that uh, if you want to create your own filters, your own parsers, you can create it as a, as a simple plugin. It has built in the reliability. So as much as possible, it will try to deliver the, collect the data, deliver the data, and try to don, do not lose the data. And we have native integration, of course, with Docker and Kubernetes. And FluentD is written in a mix of Ruby and C language. The most critical parts, mostly for performance and data serialization, are made in C. And the ecosystem, it's quite big right now. So with FluentD, you can deal with mostly of solution, mostly of backends. For example, we can deal with Elasticsearch. You can integrate with Splunk, Logly, Google Cloud Services, AWS, and many others. So the thing is that uh, year over year, uh, if we get a new cloud service available, a new backend, there's always someone writing a plugin for FluentD to centralize their logs properly. And FluentD has a modular architecture. That means uh, when I was talking about the login pipeline at the beginning, that means that also the architecture is pretty much aligned with that in order to try to solve the problem. As you can see, you can see on the left, we have the input plugins. The input take cares about to collect the data. Then we have the, the filter plugins. Sometimes if you are collecting, for example, one terabyte of data, or I don't know, 2,000 2, logs, maybe you don't want to process all of them. So you want to discard some of them. So the filter plugins allows you to filter data, maybe to discard some specific records to match some ones, or also to modify the data. For example, maybe if you're collecting data from syslog messages, you would like to append the host name or any specific detail for the machine when this syslog service is running. So a filter plugin allows you to enrich your logs or discard data or match specific logs. Then when, before you want to send this uh, the, the data that is already filtered to send it to some destination, to some output, you also would like to buffer this data. You know, there's some timing associated, there's a flush time associated. So when you buffer the data, means that you're going to store temporarily this data either in the memory or in the file system. Most of the really enterprise deployments accomplish this in the file system. You don't want to have it, oh, everything in memory because if for some reason the process crash or the container cannot continue working, you, you can lose data. So most of the big deployments, big enterprise customers try to use buffer system with the file system. And every record that goes to the buffer, it has at least a three, three specific um, data associated. With. One is a timestamp, the other is the tag. A tag is a kind of label or name which is used in order to row the data. For example, I can tag the whole my, Everything that's coming, for example, from syslog, I can apply a tag. This is my syslog. 
and then I create and create some rule so the router then can decide where to send this information based on that tag to, for example, to Elasticsearch or maybe to Google Cloud Platform or Amazon S3. And then we have the record. The record, of course, is the data, which has a structure. And then we have the output plugins. So output plugins takes care about to take the, the buffered data and transform that data to the output destination. For example, if we wanted to send information to Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch allows to ingest data over HTTP using a specific JSON format. So an output plugin takes care of take the internal record representation from FluentD and convert that to the output expected destination. And FluentD also, uh, when we talk about structured login, means that it takes a specific log message and try to make give it some sense about it. Because a, just a raw message is not too relevant. But for you can think about uh, Apache Web Server Logs, which is like a raw message, but it also has a structure. So internally, FluentD use some kind of JSON structure. It's not JSON because it's a binary version, which in message pack format. But it has many uh, different kind of sections. So the data becomes very easy to read. So you can understand that a message has different metadata. And FluentD and structural logging, it's working in a, in a lot of space. We started with a, integrating a native logging driver for Docker. It's fully integrated with Kubernetes right now. At least FluentD is like the main aggregator for Elasticsearch and Google Cloud Platform for Kubernetes deployments. You can deploy, of course, another logging agents, but FluentD is by default for Elasticsearch and Google Cloud Platform. And also the well, Google Cloud Platform is a stack driver team. So a stack driver service uses FluentD as their main agent. And of course, OpenShift uh, uses FluentD as their main aggregator, which is great also. FluentD has been integrated with structural logging on across different sections and different components. So uh, right now I would like to talk a little bit about how FluentD integrates with Kubernetes. Uh, for who's familiar with OpenShift, you know that OpenShift manage, uh, use Kubernetes to manage containers and orchestrate everything. So the way that we uh, install FluentD inside a, a Kubernetes cluster is that, well, as you know, we have the concept of, for example, the API server, and we have the nodes. And each node has different pods, and pods has different containers. So FluentD is deployed as a daemon set, and a daemon set is just a pod that runs on every node from in your cluster. Because as you know, in every node that you have in your system, every node has different pods, and every pod is generating different log services. So the goal is that you have FluentD deploys a daemon set, and this daemon set, so this FluentD has a, a mounting volume with the whole logs and start collecting the logs. But when we start collecting the logs. Also, we need to, to go beyond that. It's not just reading log files, because as you will see in the next slide, you will see that you need to enrich the log with some kind of metadata. So when the demo set is deployed, so when you have access to the whole logs from the node, because it's a shared volume, and you can see that when it start, it, when the, it start reading the log files from each container, it can determine sorry, for each application can determine it from which container ID, which container name these logs belongs to. But also it does a fallback resolution with the API server because also you would like to know what kind of metadata and what kind of, for example, labels and annotations are associated with the pod where these containers are running. So, and this is possible because a Red Hat team wrote a Fluent plugin Kubernetes metadata filter. So when FluentD is installed in Kubernetes in your own cluster, it has this Red Hat plugin. What it does is, for example, it takes the namespace, it takes the container name, and, and go back to the API server and try to discover which kind of labels and annotations are associated with this. And then this filter appends that data to each log file, sorry, to each record that it's reading. So at the end, when you are going to store the logs, FluentD already have the, for example, an association, for example, for each log, for container name, container ID, labels, annotation, 
and that information you can visualize it later on your own storage, for example, on Elasticsearch. So if you look at like a, a bare Docker container log, it's quite simple. The log message is in the log field. It has a string field which decide if it was done through the standard output, the standard error, and of course you have a timestamp a timestamp with nanoseconds. But when you push this into Elasticsearch, you get something more complex. You get the same log, the same stream, and you get some metadata. And this metadata was appended by the Kubernetes filter. For example, the Dotac ID, the Kubernetes host, the pod name, pod ID, container name, namespace ID, labels, and annotations if they exist. So we can say that Plundy is quite flexible as an architecture, but also the plugin, the filter, is making a good job. Of course, that we're going to read each log files. We're not going to talk to the API server every time. So we have a local cache for every information that we're getting. And also, when we have Fluentd trying to deliver the data to our storage, it doesn't matter if the storage and service is running inside the cluster or outside. Sometimes we can face some issues, some network outage or some connection problem or some maybe some DNS problem. So, but if you remember and you recall the initial one of the initial graphics, you can see that we have a buffer. So when we were going to send the data, Fluentd is always reading the buffer. Of course, you want to have your buffer in the file system. But if something happens, for example, it cannot deliver the data. You can configure Fluentd to perform an X time of a tries or try to do take a different approach for this kind of situation. As you know, on every cluster, you need to prepare for any kind of failure that you can face because you don't want to lose data and always you want to have a reliable system. A process crashes, application crashes, but the thing is, is how, how, what you can do to deal with that. So Fluentd, in its own case, if it cannot talk to Elasticsearch because of any external problem, it will retry until it succeeds by default. And we can, you can say, you can specify your own interval for that. You can say, uh, you can specify an exponential interval. And in the documentation, there are more options uh, to to deal with that specific thing. Also, you can say, for example, if you cannot talk to Elasticsearch, you can say you can try to implement your own uh, fallback mode, or try to do some load balancing. So you don't, in that way, you cannot just put the whole load on just one service. And when Fluentd uh, it's deployed in, a, for example, in a, as a daemon set, you know that's a daemon set for Kubernetes is always a, it's just a daemon file which specify how Fluentd needs to be deployed. So here in the slides, which uh, you will have access later, you can see a specific uh, open source project and repository which has uh, like a template for the uh, Fluentd Kubernetes daemon set. Uh, Kubernetes already comes with Fluentd in the source code, so you have your own, uh, sorry, you have your own demo set by default, but also we try to maintain an agnostic uh, Fluentd Kubernetes demo set demo files with different rules to play with different backends, for example, with Cloudly, with, for Amazon S3, for Elasticsearch. So, so we have maintained more configurations that we can find in the, in the vanilla Kubernetes uh, source code. And now, uh, well, who's using Fluentd? I will say that basically it's uh, everybody who's on this, on this session. If you are using OpenShift, you're using uh, Fluentd in the backend. Uh, also, one of the biggest users is Microsoft. As you know, Microsoft has a system which is called Operations Management Suite, OMS, and they try to monitor each node or each service that is running in, the, in their customers' platforms. And Fluentd, it's like the default agent to collect data from every service on every application that is running on those nodes. So the OEMS uh, login agent, it's built is Fluentd plus some specific plugin addition. And we can, we can find this model uh, in different ways. For example, Google is using Fluentd as a main agent, Microsoft, and well, right now it's OpenShift. In Fluentd, it's, it's a full ecosystem. I would say that it's not just a, a full and just a standalone service or program to collect data and send the data. Because Fluent, I did not mention this, but Fluentd, initially, uh, another way to communicate application 
to send sorry to send logs log applications to FluentD, we have different uh, different bindings for different languages. For example, if you're writing your own application in Golang, we have a Golang a package for FluentD, so you can make your own application talk directly to FluentD instead of let FluentD to consume the logs from the file system, so it can talk to the network. But also, I, I want to say with this that FluentD has many components because we just not try to consume log files. We try to fix the problem of the logging pipeline in a complete way. So FluentD is extendable. And we can set up, for example, when FluentD and in logging mostly, you have two modes. One is log forwarder and the other is log aggregator. And this means a log forwarder uh, takes care about to come, take the logs from some point and send this log to an aggregator. An aggregator is, is nothing else than a full solution that has really strong buffering capabilities. So for example, a FluentD can work as both as an aggregator and as a forwarder. Also, if you use just FluentD, you're using both modes at the same time. But also, there is some problems. So if you have many uh, nodes, this has some cost. As you know, handle logging and parse log is not cheap. This has a cost. Parsing a string or applying regular expression, this is quite expensive. You have computing time, and of course, you can reflect that at the end in your build. If your cluster is quite big and you're running on AWS or Google Cloud Platform, you can say that you have to pay some money to, to sustain that. So it depends on how you configure the things. It depends how much resources you're going to consume. But what happens when you have many nodes and these nodes start, and start to grow? So you, you have, you, you, at the beginning, you start like with 10 nodes, 5 nodes, but at some point, you can have like 50. So if FluentD requires, for example, a minimum of 40 megabytes to run, the average is 200 megabytes uh, in a Kubernetes cluster per node. If you deploy a quite hundred, a few hundred will be quite expensive. So also from a FluentD team perspective, we are trying to see how to help our end users to reduce the cost of their own deployments. So one solution that we come up is to separate in the log forwarder from the log aggregator. That means, for example, FluentD works up as both. But what would happen if we create a separate and lightweight log forwarder to make things cheaper? So I want to introduce very quickly to the project, which is called FluentBit, which is like a child project of FluentD written from scratch to try to solve uh, this problem. And FluentBit is part of the FluentD ecosystem, and FluentBit is also, the, also under the CNCF. So FluentBit is a solution completely written in C. It tries to be very aligned to about how the architecture of FluentD is. So it supports plugin. It has built-in reliability, and it's fully event-driven. And of course, that means that it does a lot of uh, asynchronous IO operations over the network. So what FluentD has afforded? The good thing is that FluentBit can also support many kinds of inputs, can filter the data, and also support different destinations. It has a built-in parsing support. That means that you can text, for example, unstructured text messages and give it a structure. And at as a minimum, it requires no more than 500 kilobytes. Of course, if you are doing a lot of parsing and a lot of things, this uh, requirement will increase. But it's a huge win if you have a big deployment, you have a lot of nodes, so it's times better. So the approach that we are trying to test right now, uh, FluentBit, is, uh, we have al already some early adopters, is try to put FluentBit inside uh, the most critical nodes that need performance and try to keep the memory usage quite, quite low and make FluentBit talk directly to FluentD. So on this case, FluentBit, it's working as a forwarder and FluentD just a navigator. And FluentD, it's taking care to store the logs in a reliable way in their own backends. So with this model, we can have a cheap forwarding of logs. So all of this is mostly about strategy. There's not a fixed solution for each use case, but we can find that uh, different people have different problems, and different problems need to be addressed in different ways. So FluentBit aims to solve the problem of high memory consumption and try to reduce the cost in the cluster uh, deployment. 
and one of the one of the complex things about when dealing with cloud native features is that is which is called back pressure. That means uh, back pressure is mostly the concept about when you get a lot of, for example, in on this specific context, when you get a lot of data from your input, but you cannot flush the data out at the same rate. Of course, you're going to get some back pressure because you cannot send the data out as much as fast as so you would like to. So what that means. If we take this example, the water will go out, and of course, we're going, you're going to get some back pressure because you cannot deal with, so the output cannot deal with that kind of data ingestion. And it happens mostly with different kind of backends, databases, and mostly the, the cloud service that you are going to, where you're going to send your logs are more, are quite, at times so slower than the time that you can assume your own logs. So dealing with back pressure, it's most it's quite easy if you implement implement it in the right way. So FluentD and FluentBit implement the back pressure uh, solution on which it will not ingest more data until this data can be ingested. Of course, this has some this has some, some pros and cons. But since in our class, from our context, uh, so, so from our Kubernetes context point of view. This is quite simple because since we are just reading log files, the log files becomes our buffers. Okay, so we are not going to consume more log files. So we're not going to load more data from the log files until we can flush the data. And once we can flush the data, then we can ask to ingest more data from the log files again to the backends. So with this mechanism, we can solve a back, back pressure. And different in different systems from different users are different, and sometimes you cannot have just a default configuration for everybody. You always need to review how things are going, to monitor things, and maybe you will like you will need to do your own configuration adjustments. So uh, for FluentBit, it it, it handles back pressure. It has built-in security things. It also support, it has a, its own filter to gather Kubernetes metadata. And it, we are now in the version 0.11. FluentBit will turn two years in now in July. And the next version, 0.12, will support a timestamp with nanoseconds, uh, so fractional seconds in nanoseconds unit. Sometimes you have different logs that are generated multiple times over the same time, uh, over the same second. And you would like to have some granularity over, over that time stamp. So FluentBit will also support that and FluentBit too. And well, one thing, one extra thing about FluentBit is that networking, networking and coroutines are made through a different interfaces that allow to create a full service, which is working not blocking. And also you can, from the plugins perspective, you can do a lot of network IO or perform TLS communication without block the main process. So everything is, is done through a main event loop with coroutines and different interfaces that helps the plugins. So at the moment, we don't have a full documentation how to write plugins for FluentBit, but if you look at the examples that we have, it's quite straightforward. And if you want to deploy Fluent Bit as a Kubernetes daemon set, just to test how it can behave uh, com compared with FluentD. We have a full repository and a full Docker image that has the same, pretty much the same configuration that the Fluentd uh, daemon set. And is by default, it also Fluent Bit can talk directly to Elasticsearch. So you can test how your Fluentd is working with Elasticsearch, or either you can also put Fluent Bit. It's not mandatory that you need to put FluentBit to talk to FluentD directly. So optionally, you can make it talk directly to Elasticsearch. And if you want more information about FluentBit and the project is FluentBit.io, it's fully open source, Apache license is under CNCF, as I said. And also the whole FluentBit community is under our main Slack channel. And right now, I would like to present to Anura Gupta, who's our product manager for Fluentd Enterprise, who's going to give a really small presentation about what are the enterprise features that are coming for Fluentd. Perfect. Is he, is he 
on the call and is he muted? Let's yeah. see. Maybe I've got him muted. Hey guys, I'm I'm here. Yeah. And All right. You guys can hear me. Yep, I can hear you now. Thanks. Hey, perfect. Uh, my name is Anurag Gupta, as Eduardo said, and I also work at Treasure Data, um, and I am the product manager for Fluent D Enterprise. So just kind of going as an overview about the messages that Eduardo said is, hey, you really need logging at a unified layer. Um, we need something that's reliable, something modular that's vendor agnostic in the back end, um, that's flexible. So, and and that's all great. And Fluentd really addresses a lot of those issues. Um, but what we've noticed from both Treasure Data and my background um, from being at Microsoft is there's a lot of large scale deployments that require some uh, some additional features and security. They require support and deployment. They need some best uh, configuration practices and SLAs associated with those backends. And so that's where uh, Fluent D Enterprise comes in. Um, and you can see here from the picture, it's it's really it's built on that same open core Fluent D platform. Um, but with some additional output plugins for enterprise ready backends like Splunk. And you have things like our own treasure data service. And then we're really making sure that we are adding features that are really rich for um, enterprise and the security space. If you want to click next, Eduardo. Perfect. Um, so pretty blanket slide here, but just to go over it is end-to-end -end security, Fluentd Enterprise, there's a really powerful buffering mechanism, and we've added uh, encryption to that so that when source comes in from, say, a firewall, not everyone can read that data. Uh, today in Fluentd, it's just a message pack format stored. So if you can you know, take a look at the, the buffer file, you have access to it, you can see all the data that's flowing through. Um, the certified enterprise plugins, these are both source and inputs. Um, so, for example, for Splunk, uh, we do a big benchmark with our Fluentd Enterprise bits. We make sure that we can run at uh, you know a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand messages per second. Give you performance counts, configuration around that, um, as well as some of the CPU layered with it. Um, World class support. So th this is the makers of Fluentd are with us. We have uh, folks who have written message pack. We have, you know, Eduardo who's created Fluent Bit. Uh, we have a guy who sits on the Ruby security team. Uh, so we have all the layers covered from the eventing framework, the protocol, to the actual application itself. Um, and whenever we make a fix or do any security scans and find vulnerabilities there, um, we make sure that all of the stack is going to work appropriately in these Fluentd Enterprise bits. And then uh, the last slide. Cool. Perfect timing. Um, thanks very much, guys, for um, for doing this. Is, there's one question that someone's um, just asked. Dave is asking um, if there are pieces for correlating entries from various sources to identify event storm, root cause, analysis, et cetera. And if those are enterprise features or are typically provided by third party projects or products. Right, I would put that as more of a analytic backend. So Fluentd is great at unifying the log streams for correlating entries. So you can take your events from your web server, your application server, your stack traces, throw it all into one analytic backend and hopefully that one analytic backend can do some of the things you said around event storm through cause analysis. Um, in, t in terms of event storms, there has been some cases where we think we might be able to do a little more pre-processing on the enterprise side, but I think that's a little further off than something that's available in the near term. Perfect. And so since this is a project under the CNCF um, and it is open source, where where is it, of, is it better to go to fluentd.org um, or jump on the Slack channel? If people have questions to ask, where's the best place to reach out? Actually, uh, used in, like two years ago, it used to be the, mostly the mailing list. The mailing list, I would say, that has a lot of traffic. And mm -hmm. most of the Fluentd teams trying to respond most as possible. Uh, but also, we have seen in the last year a huge growth on our Slack channel. 
Yeah. So in Slack channel, we have like 600 members, but mostly 100 are active. So right now in the position where you can go either to Slack or you have more complicated things and you want that more people look at your problem and the mailing list also is a good resource. And you can find it on the fluentd.org site in the support page, in this community, sorry, in the community section, there's the mail list, which is a Google group and more information about different or channels like could be Twitter, but most of the big issues are handled by the mail list and second as Slack. Yeah, we're finding the same thing with OpenShift Commons. We we have a mailing list. People um, put stuff in, um, you know, mostly announcements and release notices and things like that. Announcements of events like this, but the Slack channel is where people are really connecting these days, and that's probably been true for us for on um, Commons. Uh, I think it's OpenShift Commons is Slack org um, and it's it's pretty pretty active these days um, so I think that's probably a, a good place to, to pause and stop on and um, I'll put the recording of this up on uh, YouTube in a day or so and if you could send me the um, PDF version of this slide deck I will post that as well with that and on a blog post on blog.openship.com what I think might be interesting too is to do a follow-on um, and maybe demo, <clears throat> excuse me, using FluentD Enterprise and and, sh and actually do some live demo um, and showing it off too. So it might be a great thing to do as a follow on in, in a month or so, post Red Hat Summit, post the next OpenShift Commons gathering, which is May 1st in Boston. So we're co-locating that. Are any of the FluentD Treasure Data folks um, registered yet for that? I haven't seen your name on the list. It's been about 300 attendees already, so if you haven't, let me know and um, I will get you there if you're coming to um, Red Hat Summit. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, let's try to coordinate that offline. Perfect. All right, um, everyone on the call, um, there's a bunch of you there being very quiet, lurking. Is there any other questions? If not, going, going, gone. Thank you again for um, a wonderful overview of Fluent D. Um, I hadn't heard about the fluent bit part, so that's actually was really cool for me. And I hope everybody else enjoyed it and reach out and um, contribute to Fluent D and, and ask questions of Anna and Eduardo if you have them. So thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, community.